the resurrected king. And so, you know, we, we sing that and he, he robbed the grave as we have like this image of somebody who sneaks in at night and robs the grave. He didn't have to sneak. He went in and he took the keys to Hades. He didn't care who was watching because could nobody do anything about it. I don't know what you got today. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what you've got today. But he don't care who's watching. He don't have to do it sly. We don't have to come in and maybe if God could do this and finagle his way. He is powerful. He has conquered the grave. And I don't know what you got today, but he's more powerful than that. Ain't nobody sneaking around here. Jesus says, come to me. Live according to me. I, I'm giving you my word. You do this and I got your back. We're going to make it through this. I got that for you today. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for who you are. God, we know that you are in control. Lord, your, your word says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, but Father, you control eternity, God. And, and we just, we, we give you ourselves, Father. I pray that if somebody has something in here today that they have not surrendered to you, Father, that they would just lay that down as an offering to you uh, so that you can speak to us, so that you can speak through us, so that you can live in us, and that you can defeat uh, addiction, pain, uh, uh, hatred, unforgiveness, anything, Lord, that keeps us from you. And so, uh, God, give us the courage to hand it to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, we've been walking through uh, some of the Old Testament. It's been pretty cool. It's a little out of, out of the box for me. Um, as we're doing this, just sort of scripture by scripture, and we ended Genesis last week, and uh, if, if you were here or maybe you weren't, uh, you can check that, uh, check that out online. We've had some good stuff. And by the way, if you are watching online, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, people watching from all over, even outside the country. So give us a shout on there. If you're watching, we're glad that you're with us. Now, uh, we came in, in in Genesis chapter 37. We started with a man named Joseph. He was 17 years old at the time. God made him a promise. And then he didn't see that promise until after he was 30 because his brothers sold him into slavery. And uh, uh, he was... Uh, he, he was a slave and he was thrown in prison, but we found out that all of that God had orchestrated so that he could become the number two man in the most powerful nation, the most powerful dynasty uh, that was in the world at that time. It would be some time before the, the world saw anything more powerful, and he's the number two man. And because God elevated him to this status, he saved his people, right? So Joseph, that's the guy we're talking about, he brought in his 11 brothers and his father, and so they all lived there in Egypt. And Pharaoh, Pharaoh was the king, okay? Pharaoh said, you guys can have Goshen, your, your uh, shepherds, and so you take Goshen, it's got good grass, you can live there. Now, you rock on down the road a little ways, Genesis ends, we get into Exodus, and Joseph is dead, okay? Joseph and his brothers are dead, and we get a new Pharaoh, we get a new king in, and something happens. It's very interesting. Exodus chapter 1, I'm going to read verse 8 through 11 for you. A new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and powerful than we are. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them. Otherwise, they may multiply further, and when war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So the Egyptians assigned taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. They built Pithom and Ramesses as supply cities for Pharaoh. Exodus just started. We're just now in verse 11. And boom, we went from stud to dud. I mean, we were... We were supplying all the goats around this place. We were doing good. We were on our own. We had great favor with people. Our families were multiplying. Everything was going good. And then in one conversation, Pharaoh's like, you know what, guys? I think this is going to turn out badly. Let's just make them slaves. And so they're, they're just chilling out of bar mitzvah somewhere. And they walk in. You know, the Egyptians walk in. And they're like, hey, you're slaves now. And there's nothing you can do about it. And they enter, from that day, they enter into slavery. We see, now, I've, I've scoured the scripture. This, this sermon today has cost me just hours and hours of study because I assumed that if I looked hard enough, I would see where 
uh, these Hebrew people, that God's chosen people, had done something to make God angry, and so he sort of gave them over to their enemies because that happens a bunch in the Bible. You keep reading Joshua, Judges, all of the chronicles, the stories of the kings. The, the people are like, you're like, all right, God, I see what you're doing here. Like, they deserve that, and they would get conquered over, and then they would repent, and God would release them, and I mean, that just happens over and over and over, and it's a cycle, and so I assume that's what happened here, but then as I began to study, I had to change my sermon. I see no reason. Maybe there was, but, but the scripture didn't tell us. And then it hit me. Ain't that the way it goes? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, pastor, I've done some things. Like, I'm in a season of life, and that's, that's my bad. You know, I, I, I deserve that. But then you have some stories, too, where you go, what was that all about? I have no idea what just hit me. What if I did what I do? Like I started, I started a business and then you started a virus? Like what, what is this? I just, I just didn't see it coming. I didn't do anything inherently evil that I know of. Like we're running through the list of, of done me wrongs, but like the other way, like what did I do? What have I done? And I just, I don't see anything, and it just happened to him. And my question is, how did I get here? And the answer is, I don't know. Maybe you know. Maybe you're, uh, we've all had those seasons of life where we're there, and we know exactly how we got there. <laughs> and we need to repent, but we're waiting on it. But then there's this season that's, that's huge. And it happened, it's changing everything. Like this, I, I, I've worked so hard to get up to this point, and then pff, just the bottom falls out, I had nothing to do with it. And the question is, how did I get here? It's important to know how you get somewhere Okay? In the same way that when you're, when you're driving down the road, like you guys can't, is my steering wheel. Okay, when I'm driving down the road, I have this massive windshield in front of me and I have these side views and I can see a lot. But I have this little bitty mirror that shows me my past. So I have to have that. You can glance at that just to make sure obstruction is not there you know what I'm saying like it's good to see a little bit of what happened and how do we get here but 95% of our view needs to be where I'm going but you have this 5% view that goes what was that all about now here's a question and I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put this question out there I'm just gonna drop it but hold on we'll pick it up later there seems to be no reason for these people who have been put in slavery. Now at other times, yes, absolutely, we see that, you deserve it. <laughs> but this is like maybe a couple hundred years of slavery. I mean, there's multiple generations that were born into it and died into it. Here's the question. Could it be that they needed the slavery? Could it be that these people needed for this to happen? Now we're going to pick that back up, but let me phrase it in a couple different ways. Could it be that what happened to this generation saved the next generation? Could it be that these people had to suffer and endure something that has affected you? We'll pick that back up later. Here's my second question, because the first one is, how did I get here, right? And, and you know how you got most places, but sometimes we just, we just don't know. We just have to say, I don't know. I think those are the three most important uh, words of faith. I actually didn't, didn't come up with this myself. I was uh, uh, reading a, uh, a book the other day and somebody said the three most important words in faith are not I still believe, it is I don't know. 
Because when I can say, I don't know, but I still have faith, God has brought my faith to a whole new level of maturity. Second question is, is God here with me? So however I got in the season, great season, eh, bad season, whatever, how did I get here and is God here with me? Stay with me, Exodus 1, 12 through 21. But the more they oppressed them, this is the Egyptians oppressing the Hebrew people, the Israelite people. But the more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied and spread so the, the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Hmm, that's interesting. They worked the Israelites ruthlessly and made their lives bitter with difficult labor in brick and mortar and in all kinds of field work. They ruthlessly imposed all this work on them. Verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, the first whose name was uh, Shifra and the uh, second whose name was Pua, when you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. If the child is a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. The midwives, however, feared God. As if it wasn't bad enough already. The midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this and let the boys live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. So God was good to the midwives. This is getting weird. God was good. I'm in slavery, but God is good. I've been told to kill babies, but God is good to the midwives. It's so weird. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very numerous. Since the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Is it, is it possible that in your darkest season that you didn't even ask for, that God is still good to you? Think, think back on your life. Did you not get the closest to God in the worst of seasons? Isn't that strange? I'm not wishing this on anybody, and I understand like the depth of what I'm speaking to. This is actually very difficult even to say because it just like wearing my, wearing my Adidas up here preaching in the air conditioning, it sounds good, but these people lived and died in slavery. Like, oh, you broke your back? No, nah, there's nothing for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is extremely hard. And, of course, that was way back then. That's millennia ago. And I'm talking to people in the most difficult season in their life, and they're like, did he just say I needed the season? No. I'm asking, is God with you in this season? We could sit down and talk about your story. We could sit down and talk about why you're here and how, how it's not your fault and I would agree with you and I couldn't do anything but cry with you and ask you this. In this tough time, does that necessarily mean that God left you? Doesn't that mean that you need God more? Look at our country. Look at the demographics in our country. And, and we have pockets in our country where, uh, where uh, education and prosperity are, are, are normal and where uh, uh, poverty is, is a little more normal. And you take those same demographics and look at the uh, religious participation. Which do you think has greater participation? Which do you think has uh, uh, an extra measure of faith? Well, let me tell you what you find. You'll find the ones who go to Jesus because they cannot view themselves as God. So you say, well, they have greater poverty, and they'll say, ooh, maybe not. <laughs> what does it profit a man if he gains a whole world and forfeits his own soul? And many of you today can say, I'm thankful for my biggest trials because without that, I don't know if I would have ever turned to Jesus. I don't know, had, had Pharaoh not said, throw all the babies in the Nile, I don't think I would have ever seen God save the babies. You wouldn't have been talking about it millennia later. I don't know if maybe, 
Maybe it wouldn't have been that much more miraculous when God brings about Moses. Now, hold on, I'm going to get there in a minute. But before we go back to Moses, talking about us again, is there a reason that God saved you? Now, think about this. Is there a reason that you had to go through some trials? Or did God just allow it? Now, all these, I'm not, I, I, I'm not gonna give you an answer to this today. But here's what I'm gonna say, that God will orchestrate it all the way around. Look around and ask yourself this. Did the very things that I have cursed God over bring me here to him today? Did God do that to you? No, probably God didn't do that to you. It's a result of sin in the world. God is here to bring you out of it. But how could you allow this to happen? Because he wants you to come home. We said this weeks ago, let the wolf chase you back to the shepherd. The presence of the wolf doesn't mean that you abandon the shepherd. It means you run back to the shepherd. Now here's the reason I'm asking this question. Because in this time when he says, you know what? Here's what we'll do. We'll just throw all the babies in the Nile. Terrible. It's one of the worst things that, oh my goodness. Put me in slavery. I'll, I'll work in slavery. Don't throw my babies out to die. But in the midst of that, one woman has a baby. And she sees, the Bible says, she sees that the baby was attractive. When I think what it means is he's, he's vigorous. This, this baby is going to be healthy. He's able to sustain life. And so she just couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. It's worth it. They might torture me. They might kill me. I'm not throwing this baby in the river. And so she raises the baby. She hides the baby until she can no longer hide the baby. And then she makes a raft. She makes it able to float, and she puts the baby on the raft, and she sends the baby down the Nile. Now, she has an older daughter, older than the baby, and the daughter follows the baby. She hides in the reeds, right? In the south, we call those cattails. So she hides in the reeds, and she's watching the baby, and just down the river, the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, is taking a bath, and she sees the raft, and she picks it up, and she says, a Hebrew baby. And she begins, we assume, to play with the baby, to talk to the baby, to do something with the baby. She sent her servant, go get that thing, bring me the baby. And so the, the sister pops out of the reeds and is like, hey, you found a baby. Imagine that. You want me to go get somebody to, uh, to feed it for you? Because they're not going to run down and get a can of formula. And they said, that's a great idea. So she goes and gets the baby's mother. And the mother is able to raise the baby. Now all the others are dead. This one gets saved. And we can see that now, but you know what they saw then? All the others are dead. It's an atrocity. But this baby gets saved. Now, this child is picked up by the princess and given an Egyptian name. This is one's going to blow you away because you thought this was a Jewish name. It is not. It is an Egyptian name. The name given to the baby was Moses. Now, most of the time, Moses was a common name. It means I drew you out, but they would have named you like Ra Moses or whatever, saying that our God, whatever God they wanted to worship, drew you out, right? So they call the baby Moses because she says, I drew you out of the river. It's an Egyptian name. <coughs> <coughs> Moses grows up. In Pharaoh's household, at some capacity, we have no idea if he was a servant, if he thought that he was an Egyptian. We have no idea. We know that he looked like an Egyptian because later when he meets his wife, she says, an Egyptian helped me today. But Moses grew up for 40 years, and in 40 years, at some point, he gets convicted because he knows he's a Hebrew. Did he know all the while growing up? We have no idea. All we know is at 40, he walks out, he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and he kills the dude, hides him in the sand. The next day, he walks out, and he sees two Hebrew uh, people arguing, and he says, why are you arguing? Like, we need to come together. And uh, they were like, what are you going to do? You're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? He goes, ooh, y'all knew about that? 
And then sure enough, Pharaoh knew about that too. And so they were trying to kill him. So he, dude, he's, he's got to scram. He goes. So he goes down. We believe he went south. And uh, there he meets a woman that we think probably would have been what we would know today as an Ethiopian woman. Uh, so that's sort of where she would have come from, like in our terms today, modern day Ethiopia. Now, he meets this woman, they get married, they have sons, and he works for her father, his father-in-law, for 40 years. Now he's 80 years old. One day, he's tending his sheep, and he sees a bush that's just on fire, but it's not being burned up. Like, it's on fire, but it's not being consumed. And so he goes over, and God begins to speak with him, and when he goes over, God calls him commands him, tells him, I'm going to overemphasize this, God tells him, it's not just his idea, he didn't pursue God going, hey, can I go back to Egypt? He doesn't want to go. God tells him to go back to Egypt. That's going to be really important here in just a moment. And so he he says this uh, through the bush. And here's the interesting thing. God tells him this because he's heard the cry of the people. I don't know how long they've been in slavery at this point. Well over 100 years. Probably closer to 200 years they've been in slavery at this point. Not exactly sure. And just now God's hearing the cry of the people? But wait a minute. Remember, I asked you, did God possibly put you where you are for a reason? Does God have something for you? Is God with you in the midst of where you are? See, here's the thing. God is hearing the cries of the people, and so he calls Moses. But guess when he brought Moses out? Guess when he set Moses up to be the man? Eighty years ago. Do you understand that God is answering tomorrow's promise Tomorrow's request, tomorrow's prayer request, yesterday, do you realize that? Do you realize that where you are is no coincidence because you are Moses to somebody? Moses was nothing special. I'm going sh- to prove that here in a minute. Now, he was a very humble man, but probably there's a reason because he grew up a Hebrew in an Egyptian household. And I don't know about you guys, but I think, judging by culture, I, somewhere I've, I've heard this, that when people come in and out of slavery, the others tend to not treat them very well. So maybe that has something to do with why he's so humble and relies on God instead of himself. Maybe there's something to do with him being one of the only men around this age because the rest were thrown into the Nile River and killed. Maybe it's important that he was raised in Pharaoh's household because he speaks their language and he knows their customs and he's able to speak directly to Pharaoh. Maybe, probably, certainly, and it happened 80 years ago so that it will happen today. Understand that in your trial, God is already orchestrating the answer to your prayers. Now, if you're Moses, you are the answer to a prayer. And Moses could be in the wilderness going, why do I have to do this? Because because. He killed somebody over this. At some point, Moses is going, why me? Why did I get to live here when everybody else has had to? You know what I'm saying? You ever do that? Y'all need to go with India, to, to India with me sometime. I, I promise you, at some point, you'll ask this question. Why did I get to grow up in the U.S. and they have to do this? Why did I get to be so blessed? But do you understand that maybe your greatest blessing is not just a blessing, it's your responsibility, And so Moses is brought up in a specific way for a specific reason because he had a specific responsibility. Why, God, why have you allowed this to happen to me? Hang on, you'll see. (laughs) Hold up. You're going to see. It's going to unfold. I want to tell you that God hasn't left you In your darkest hour, you're like, well, that was fine for the Egyptians, but I'm the one who's put myself here. Yeah, and he'll use that too. Don't miss the part in Genesis where the brothers who threw Joseph into a well and sold him into slavery, they got blessed in the end too. Don't miss that part. Everything is not this accident. You're not just some victim of circumstance. Some of us need to raise up out of victimhood and go, okay, 
I don't know why, I don't know how, but here we are. What do you need to do with what I've got? Moses gets called back. Now, I set out a question. We laid it down. Let's pick this back up. Did the people need to go through this? I can't answer that, but I just want to propose a couple ideas. If the people hadn't gone through slavery, if the people hadn't been so captive, because by the time you're a couple generations into slavery, it starts messing with this up here. You know what I'm saying? It ain't just the chains, it's the chains. Y'all ever been in the chains? where it's not just something that physically happened to me, but I begin to see myself in a certain way. I begin to see my future in a certain way. I begin to lose hope in a certain way. You know what I'm talking about? And so now they're in chains in every way. And had they not been in these chains, would their deliverance have been so great? Would the world have known who God is had he not given such a miraculous deliverance? Nobody would be telling this story millennia later if they just said, well, these guys were in slavery for like a year, but then they busted out of the joint. Oh, cool story. Forgotten in history books long ago. No. They were slaves and God was with them in their slavery. He heard their cry in their slavery. He was kind and gave the midwives families in their slavery. And because of their slavery, they changed all the generations after them. Do you realize that Jewish people are still celebrating this today? Do you know that you celebrate this today? We're setting up the stage for Easter. This is the Passover that's going to happen. It has changed you. We had a young lady from the college who moved here, an atheist, two years ago, attended our Easter service, and she thinks maybe she believes in God now. We're still on the effects of this slavery. God has not forgotten you, abandoned you. I have no idea what's happening. All I could probably do is cry with you. I can't give you answers to why, but I can tell you God hasn't left you. And Jesus came to break this slavery. This is representative of the people. They had to go through this. The Bible doesn't make sense without this part. But somebody had to suffer it. So that brings us to you. Did you really need that? Did God really allow me to go through that because maybe I needed that? Again, I don't want to put anything into the scripture that's not there. I'm, I'm, I'm laying this out to you. You can, uh, you, you can work with this as, as you see fit, weigh it against scripture. We had a young lady die not so long ago. Many of you even in here uh, knew her and loved her. But this was years ago in our county she passed away. She had children, young. It was horrible. It was tragic. I was just meditating on this, like, <laughs> the same thing I imagine that they're asking, like, how? How could this be part of the plan? And I had, like, a daydream. I'm not telling you I had, a, I had a vision from God. Now, I, I have had that before, and I'll tell you when that happens, and I'm certain of it. But just, I, I just saw this in my mind. I saw this woman who had, had a, she had multiple children, but I saw her son. And this was 15 years down the road or whatever, 14 years down the road, and the, and the boy had gotten his driver's license. Now, in reality, when she passed away, her son was little. But in my mind, I saw him driving, and, and it was dark, and there was a car flipped over in the bar ditch. And she was holding her dead son, crying out to God, let me trade places with him. Take me instead of him. And my question is, did God answer that cry 14 years before it happened? Because he saw it. We can't see it, so we question him. But he saw it. And she gladly traded. We said, well, that's a jump. Well, he answered their cry 80 years before they cried it. 
Could God be answering your cry from the future today? And you're questioning him on it. We're calling God out on it like he doesn't know what he's doing. You see this? He sees. God answered their prayer 80 years before they prayed it. God is answering your prayers now. God is answering somebody else's prayers with you. God is going to use the sum of things that makes you, you, for his glory, if you will just let him. He calls Moses out and says, go back to my people. And Moses is like, that is the one place I don't want to go. Isn't that about the place God calls you to? <laughs> like, hey, I brought you out of addiction. I need you to go help us. No! <laughs> no, I'm done with that. Isn't that about right? You remember when your marriage struggled so hard? Yeah, your neighbor's having that same problem. We want you to go relive all those memories again. <laughs> so God calls Moses back. And this is the interesting thing. This is, this is where we're going to end. Because the question is, will God allow me to be set free? Will God use me to set other people free? Okay, so maybe he's with me in this trial. Maybe there's something that I can't see. But will it end? Exodus 4, 24 to 26. Burning bush, God calls Moses to go back. So Moses is on his way. Like he packs up his wife, his sons. We're going back to Egypt. I mean, you can't ask for more than that, right? This is, the, this, this is so strange. This, this passage has like haunted me for years. And I finally think I understand it. On the trip, this is on the trip back to Egypt. At an overnight campsite, it happened that the Lord confronted him and intended to put him to death. Him is Moses. It gets, it gets more strange and painful. So Zipporah took a flint, a rock, cut off her son's foreskin, threw it at Moses' feet and said, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood, referring to the circumcision. And if you're like me, you have no idea what just happened. So, Moses is being obedient to God. And he's going back to Egypt where he doesn't want to go to talk to the people that he doesn't want to talk to, to go through things in the past that he doesn't want to go through again. And he really is humble. I'm not the leader type of person. He's going to beg God. My tongue is slow. I think we think that he had a major speech impediment. He probably had a stutter because he said, my tongue is sluggish. Like the word for that would be like, I can't move my legs, right? So uh, please help. And so God says, okay, I'll let your brother speak for him. You just tell Aaron what to say. Aaron will say it. And, and so he's going back. Wait, what more can you ask for? And so on the way, God confronts Moses and he's going to kill him. We don't know how. Maybe he's rolling around in pain. Maybe he's sick. Maybe there's an angel there. You can see a physical manifestation. Whatever happened, God is ticked. He's going to kill him. Why? He's being obedient. You said go and I went. But his wife knew something because she goes Native American, breaks a rock, sharpens that baby off, whips her son out on the rock, and whoosh, dices off his foreskin, which is not the skin on your forehead, and throws it at Moses' feet, and God relents and forgives Moses. This has always puzzled me. He's doing what you ask. Give the boy a break. Here's the thing. Is God with you? Yes. Abandoning God in your toughest season is only going to make things worse. Draw closer to him. He is the shepherd who protects you from the very thing that you're running from. He's not the cause of it. He's the cure for it. But, no, let me add to that. He will also use you to help others. He will call you out. We call that the priesthood of the believer. God wants to use you to save someone else. And he will use you. Here's the but. But he wants you to do it his way. Now here's the thing. Moses' great-grandfather was Abraham. God told Abraham,
All your descendants need to be circumcised on the eighth day. All your males born are circumcised on the eighth day. Moses grew up in Egypt where little boys are circumcised at 14 years old. Moses' children had not yet been circumcised, otherwise the poor wouldn't have had anything to come up with here, telling us that Moses is trying to do the will of the Hebrew God living like an Egyptian. Understand that Moses is going to go on to do some amazing things. His staff is going to turn into a snake that eats other people's snakes. He's going to turn water into blood. He's going to put his staff down into uh, the Red Sea and it's going to part and frogs and gnats and flies and plagues and hell are going to come and the firstborn of everybody is going to die. It all happens at the hand of Moses and God is saying, I don't need you for any of it. But if you want to do it my way, I'll use you for all of it. You want to live like the world? You want to take the path of the devil, but end up at the destination of the Lord? No dice. I don't need you. I set you up 80 years ago. I called you out, not because I needed you, but because I wanted to use you. You want to live like an Egyptian? You die like an Egyptian. And so he confronts him. Did you see the word there? He confronts him. They know exactly what it's about. And so I think that God is saying to you, to me, you want to follow Jesus, follow Jesus. But he's not a buffet. He's not a smorgasbord. We don't get to pick the parts of Jesus that we like, but live like the world the rest of the time and end up at his destination used for his glory doing great and miraculous things. It doesn't work that way. Moses, supposed to circumcise your sons at eight days. That's what I commanded you to do. I know the Egyptians do it different, but did your, did your parents ever say this to you? As long as you live in my house, you'll circumcise your kids on the eighth day. Don't make me pull this camel over. <laughs> God wants to use you. God is going to use you. If I did not believe that, why are we even meeting? What are we doing? God is going to use you, and he's already set you up for success. Why? Because you have a limp. You have pain. You have trials that you've been through that nobody else has been through, but somebody else is going to go through, and they need you to show them where the shepherd is. And he's going to use you on his terms, and only on his terms. I want the worship team to come up. And this is the last thing. Jesus wants to use you. He will use you, but he doesn't need you. He just allows us, right? We can choose or not. That's a great thing about our God. He's a gentleman. He's not forcing you, but he wants to use you. You are an heir. If you are a believer, you are an heir. That means I receive an inheritance. That means that the Holy Spirit is mine. That means that I have power to speak into people's lives. That means that I will pray over people and they will be healed. I will speak to people and they will be touched. I will encourage people and they will come out of depression. People will come out of addiction. The Holy Spirit is going to use you as long as you do it on his terms. But those are all inheritances I have received, you have received as a child of God. If you're not a child of God, you cannot receive a child's inheritance. Step one in getting out of the slavery that I'm in, step one in having Moses come rescue me or being Moses for someone else is to be a child of God. We can't be circumcised at 14 years old. I'm speaking proverbially, per proverbially here, okay? Maybe I need to just backtrack on that. We can't do things the world's way and expect God's results. Step number one is receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'll do it your way, Lord.
He asks some tough things. I'm trying to tell you this in advance. He's going to ask you some really uncomfortable stuff. But then you get the inheritance of a child of the king. So if you'll bow and pray with me. Many people that have been in and out of the doors of this building joined us as a body, a congregation, a church, have walked in claiming to be a Christian and realizing later, you know what, I've actually not really followed Jesus. Some just have it in question, and we, we applaud you that you're honest about those, about those questions. You're not going to fake it till you make it when you're talking about the kingdom of God. But if you have reached a point where you say, I need to follow, I need to become a child, I need to be baptized, I encourage you to take that first step today. I want you to pray with me. If you're online right now, I want you to pray with us, but don't let it end right there. Message us, call us. We wanna walk through this with you. Write something on your connection card. Come up after service and visit with the worship team. We want to speak with you. I want you to pray this with me. If that's you, I want you to pray this with me. Father, I need you. Accept me as your child, and I will live by your word. Save me. Bring me out of captivity. Bring me out of sin. Lead me to your kingdom. Lead me to your promised land. In Jesus' name. The worship team is going to play one last song. And uh, when they do, some baskets are going to come up. If you're a believer, part of the way that we worship is with our tithe and offering. Uh, so you can do that. But also, if you have that connection card, we want to hear from you. So place that connection card in there. Stand and worship with us.